dodge this. One world currency. The new world order. Those are the roots of trouble. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. Hmm? Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Well, we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of election, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night, instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. But I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. And now, welcome to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. Here's your host from FederalJack.com. It's Popeye. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to tonight's live edition of Down the Rabbit Hole. It is November 19th, 2013. On tonight's edition, I'm going to be playing an interview I did about a month and a half ago uh, with Beverly Oliver. She is one of the last surviving witnesses to the assassination of President John F. Kennedy 50 years ago. This week is the 50th anniversary. This Friday, the 22nd, will be the 50th anniversary of his death, his murder. And there are not many people left alive that were actually there that day and witnessed it. Most of the people that were around, uh, that were in the plaza, are dead. I would say 98, you know, 98 to 99% of them are dead. There's only a few, literally a handful left. And one of them happens to be Beverly. And I had the honor of sitting down and having a very raw, uh, emotional, and brutally honest conversation about what she witnessed, uh, what happened to her in the aftermath, the harassment, and her uh, speaking out. It's just very powerful, very, very powerful story. And Beverly herself is the epitome of what you would call a Southern Belle, if you look up Southern Belle in the dictionary, you will see a a picture of Beverly's smiling face. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to get right to it because we don't have a ton of time and this is a long interview. I promise you it's going to be worth it. So sit back, put your feet up, get your thinking caps on, ladies and gentlemen. You're about to hear from a piece of living history. Here we go. My interview with Beverly Oliver. Ladies and gentlemen... Tonight, I am joined by a piece of living history, someone who was literally 20 feet, 20 feet, I would say, from President John F. Kennedy when he was assassinated in Dealey Plaza. Now, there aren't too many living witnesses left alive today, and as I've said to her, off air. Um, She has a lot of courage to come out and talk about what she witnessed because a lot of people were threatened, a lot of people died, 
uh, which her and I will get into, but uh, it takes a lot of courage to stand up and tell the truth. So I want to introduce you all today to Beverly Oliver. Beverly, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you, Papa. It's my honor to be with you tonight. It is an honor to be able to talk to you. And when I say that you are a piece of living history, I don't mean it like as radio shtick or anything like that. It's, it's actually the truth. Uh, you really are a piece of living history. You're one of the very few. I think it, there's only you and maybe one or two other people that might still be left alive that were there that day in Dealey Plaza and that witnessed it. Not not somebody that saw the Zapruder film or, or researched it. Not somebody like me that years later looked into it. I mean, you were literally there on the ground. So let's let's get right into it. Let's pick it up right there. And you can get as descriptive as you want. You're on the ground the morning of November twenty second, nineteen sixty three, and you're you're there in Dealey Plaza. You're there to see President John F. Kennedy. Um describe this the, the what you see, describe what happened. Well, I had a brand new camera, Papa, that a friend of mine, actually the man that I was dating, his name was uh, Larry Ronco, had given me. He was a, a man, the manager of the Six Flags uh, Kodak store, and that's where I met him. And he had given me a camera. He had been home to New York, came back, and he had this camera. It was a uh, an 8 millimeter um, Yashica movie camera. Brand new, it was a prototype, wasn't on the market yet. He gave me uh, 12 rows of film, he gave me 12 envelopes. The film even had to be mailed back to Rochester, New York to be developed. And uh, I was excited to not just to see the president, which that was, of course, number one desire, uh, but also to take a film using my new camera. And so I parked my car uh, on Commerce Street that morning where I always parked it. We, uh, the showgirls, we bought our parking places by the night in the parking lots next door to the club. And I parked my car and I changed into my walking shoes and I walked, I started walking, um, I guess it would be west on Commerce Street. And uh, I walked and I walked and I didn't have any plans about going to Dewey Plaza that day. I just wanted to get somewhere close to the curb so I could get film of the president with my new camera. And I was looking up the side streets, and they were just packed. There was no way that you could get up to the curb. So I kept walking, and uh, about 10 blocks, uh, and I came to Houston Street, and I saw the people lined up, you know, from Main uh, right on Houston and then left on Elm. I didn't take even on Blonde. I still figured out that must be the way that the, the motorcade was going. So I walked across the grassy triangles and down to the end of, of the row of people, and that's where I was standing that day when the horrible murder happened in broad daylight um, in downtown Dallas. <laughs> I was, um, uh, that day, I mean, there was such an excitement in the air. It was like um, being in a situation where there's so much static electricity in the air that the hair literally on the back of your neck and on your arms stood up. That's that's the kind of atmosphere that it was in Dealey Plaza that day. There was so much excitement and so much anticipation. And uh, you could tell when uh, the president got closer and closer because the crowds got louder and louder. And I'm standing there, and they turned on to, uh, on, right onto Houston. And then just as they turned left onto, to, onto Elm, but I had already taken my camera uh, and started and made sure that it was in working order. I took pictures of uh, film of the crowd and of the buildings, you know, just making sure everything was working because I did not want to miss the opportunity to film the president. And as soon as they turned, started to turn left onto Elm Street, I started filming. And in just a few seconds, actually, after they turned on to, or it seemed like it was a few seconds after they turned onto Elm Street, there was a noise that went bang, bang, bang. And at the time, I thought that you're too young to remember those things we call poppers that they throw on the sidewalk and they'd pop like a firecracker, but you didn't have to light them. You just threw them on the ground and they'd Yeah, pop. the little white sacks of paper with the black powder in them. Yeah, that's it. And that's, I, I remember thinking distinctly to myself, why would somebody let their kids bring those down here? And I'm still filming and uh, the president gets by me. And I, at that point, I still was not aware that he had been shot. Um, wasn't aware that the noise I'd heard was shots. And uh, uh, I started filming in concert with with the uh, 
the motorcade. Uh, I was when I, when I started, I was to the right of. Uh, Oh gosh, I can't think of his name. Now the guy and his son, uh, the ranger guy and his son, uh, Charles Brim and his son, and then to his left was Gene Hill and Mary Mormon. When the murder happened, the assassination happened, I was on the other side of all them uh, at the end of it. So I had walked in concert filming. And um, so you were talking about the people that were still alive. To my knowledge, it is just uh, Mary Mormon, myself, and the Newmans. Just as the president got past me to my left, there was this big noise that went, <clears throat> and it was like the whole back of his head just came off. It came out, like arched out over the back of the, the trunk of the car. It just like blood, like a bucket of blood was thrown out of the back of his head. And I just went into complete shock, just absolute, total shot. People are always asking me, did the car stop? I don't know, Papa, whether the, the car stopped. Or the whole wall stopped for me for a little bit. And I don't know how long that little bit was. It was the most horrific thing I have ever experienced in my life. And to this day, I still have horrible nightmares. Not as frequently as they were because I did go under some hypnotism to try to get rid of some of it. And uh, it has helped a lot, but I still have horrible nightmares about that day. And if there was a day in my life that I could change, it would be November the 22nd, 1963. Were you hit with any uh, blood or anything from Jack when he got hit? Like, was it because I know some of the, the people on the side that, like, right there on the grass, or like, I know one of the, the sheriffs and the, the motorcade was hit. So I, uh, you know, one of the police officers riding the, the motorcycles was hit. So I'm not sure, um, you know, how many other people actually got hit with any uh, blood splatter or anything. So I mean, not to be graphic or anything, but there has been people who have written and have said that I had blood splatter on the front of my dress or my coat. Actually, I couldn't hit my dress without a coat on, but I, it didn't. Um, there was blood splatter down at my feet at the curb, not exactly where I was standing, but on the curb side, there was blood splatter. And um, Clint Hill, you know, climbed into the back of the car, and a lot of people say the reason that Jacqueline was trying to crawl out was she was trying to get away. She was not. There was a piece of, of the president's skull laying on the back of the trunk, and she crawled out to retrieve that piece of skull, and Clint's testimony was is that she tried to piece his head back together on the way to the hospital. I mean, it was just, you cannot imagine. The Zubruder film does not do it justice. Even with the you know, home video footage now and news video footage, that stuff doesn't do actually seeing something that horrific, being there and witnessing uh, something that horrific, especially, you know, I mean, now people maybe are, are more uh, desensitized because of video games and violent movies and stuff, but... Back then, it was a more innocent time. I mean, I know there were nefarious things going on behind the scenes, yes, but the country as a whole, I think, you know, on its face was a was a much more wholesome country. People don't stop and think that that, that was before the days of Water, Watergate, the days before I ran Contra. Those were the days when we thought, when the Bible says, let us, God said, let us make man in our image, we thought it was God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the U.S. government. Uh, uh, we were so innocent. That's why I say that November the 22nd, 1963 was when I lost my virginity. I lost my innocence that day, Papa. <laughs> and now every, even innocent things that, that our country does, I, I, I guess I see conspiracies behind every tree. I don't know, but I question everything. There's not anything that happens that I do not question. I don't blame you. I mean, <laughs> that's an eye-opening event, and I mean, I everybody has their own awakening. But that, wow! I mean, that that had to be that had to be something to witness. You were literally within twenty feet. I mean, you saw the whole thing. You were smart enough to keep your yourself out of uh, out of the uh, the spotlight uh, and get yourself uh, uh, taken out, like some of these other witnesses. I, I you know, you were. I, I saw an interview you did with. Um, uh, on uh, the men who killed Kennedy, one of the Nigel Turner. yeah, when Nigel when Nigel Turner interviewed you, 
and uh, I, I saw a clip, one of the, the clips, and you had said, you know, I, I didn't want to end up like some of these other people that got shot in the back of the head with a shotgun, you know, and I, I, <laughs> I don't blame you. It wasn't that I was so smart, but I surrounded myself like I still do today with very smart people, so... You know, I had a cushion to to keep me doing the right things. At least you had somebody looking out for you. And, if uh, you know, obviously if they didn't, we wouldn't have the valuable insight, uh, you know, not only but what you witnessed, but, you know, your thoughts and, you know, your research as well into it. And I think I think it's so interesting how, you know, this experience automatically, like you just said, you, now you see conspiracies behind everything. And I don't think it's that you see conspiracies behind everything. I just think it's you see through the BS and now you you had your your fog that fog of whatever lifted off your eyes that in like you said you you lost your virginity on November twenty second nineteen sixty three I think that's a very uh, poetic way to put what happened to this country in a perspective. Well, and but through it all, Papa, I just I want to say this: through it all, I am still in love with America. I'm still one of these people that cry with like those oh, boys. And I, and I hope I always have that in me because I know that America has spots, blemishes, and wrinkles. That's because we, as Americans, have spots, blemishes, and wrinkles. But we're still the best country on the face of the earth, and we always will be. And I do believe that from the bottom of my heart. So you, you, you mean to tell me you're not some sort of communist tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist, government-hating, you know, whatever other no. moniker they could throw no, you, not. you know what I mean? And no, that, I'm not. And, and of course, I'm being facetious. I know that. Uh, uh, no, you you are a true patriot, Beverly, uh, through and through. You really are. Uh, again, it takes a lot of courage to to stand up and even just tell your story. Uh, you know, so many people were threatened, and I know even yourself uh, went through uh, a deal of intimidation. Um, so, in fact, I I, I want to get into that a little bit. So, you witness President Kennedy getting shot. You witness this horrific uh, event. Uh, which obviously has has you know left a, a, a mark on you for forever. You know something that'll never go away. It's a memory that that will always be with you. Um, you witness this horrific event. What happens next? I mean, you just watch the president of the United States get his head blown off. Like you said, everything stopped for you. You're in this daze. Time slows down. Um, I understand what you mean about that, by the way, because if you've ever witnessed someone die. Uh, that especially someone that you might have admiration or you care about or that you're close to in some way, shape, or form. It's it's very or even if you're just on the scene when someone just dies, um, it's a very weird scenario. The the world gets very quiet, almost like you're in a vacuum, uh, and it the, the everything around you gets very light. Like a, there's almost like a white light. I, I don't know how to describe mm-hmm. it, but I've, I've witnessed it. Uh, myself, so I can understand kind of like what you mean by when time stops and everything. I I I, I have an understanding of uh, what you went through. So you're in this this vacuum, you know, everything is just, and you're you're it's almost like you're stuck in time, and then boom, everything comes back into the moment, and you're back in real time. What happens next? And then that's almost like fast paced when that happens. It's it's almost like you're going faster than the world does, um, and. I don't know how long I stood there with my camera. There's a picture of me standing there with everybody else on the ground. I'm standing there with my camera up to my chest in shock. And I don't know when I finally walked across the street, but I finally walked across the street. And let me correct some things that are being said, if you don't mind, at this point. I did not run up the steps. That is another lady wearing the same type of coat, a little bit darker than mine. And she was standing down closer to the boot depository building. She also had on a scarf, not exactly like mine, but similar to the one I had on. And she is a lady running up the steps. That is not me. I walked across. I joined a group of people down at the bottom of the steps over to, as you face the steps, to the right just a little bit. There's a picture of me standing there. Uh, And I kept thinking, you know, they're going to want to talk to me in a minute. I saw people take people because I didn't even know about the Secret Service and all that stuff, you know, as a kid. And, uh... Um, I was watching them take people aside to talk to them. I thought, well, they're going to want to talk to me in a minute. And I stood there for a little while. And then I saw this policeman that I know come across the the hill, the, the knoll part off of the pergola uh, down down on the grass and was walking like, walking somewhere. And I recognized him as um, a policeman I was used to seeing all the time. He was married to Jack 
Ruby's uh, hostess, her name was Geneva White. And I was used to seeing him every night when I would go over to uh, go out with some of the girls up there. Um, we would go out to the Alibaba Club at night afterwards. It stayed up at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning or 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning. We had a band and everything. And we'd go out there dancing afterwards. And the most of the time I was over there, either to pick a daughter or Shari or somebody, and we'd go out. And uh, so I was just sitting in this cop. I knew who I saw. And even though I had on a dark wig that day, he was used to seeing me in dark hair, blonde hair, blue, blue hair, green hair. I wore all colors of hair back then. It was the thing to do. And um, so I knew he recognized me when I saw him and made eye contact with him. I knew he knew who I was. So I also realized if they wanted to talk to me, he knew where to find me. We didn't know what had happened to the president yet. You know, there wasn't any such things as cell phones and stuff like that. We were all in the dark. I didn't know if he was dead. I didn't know if he was alive. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know if everybody in the car had been killed. I didn't know. And so I wanted to get back to my car and get to the radio. So I, ha- I hot-tailed it back down to the parking garage, got in my car, and I had an old Buick. And uh, I uh, went down to 75, which is North Central Expressway, and then you could turn left on the North Central Expressway. And there used to be a Holiday Inn almost in downtown. It was the old Tommy kind, you know, one level, and you parked at your door and got out and walked in. And it was one of the premier hotels in Dallas at the time. And I pulled off, uh, I remember just before I got to the exit to that hotel hearing on the radio, because it was an old car, the radio wouldn't work in the high buildings downtown. And uh, I heard it right there just before I got to that hotel, which was really almost downtown. And I... I pulled off to that parking lot and sat there and cried. For how long, I don't remember. But uh, it was a horrific day, absolutely horrific. Now you're you're sitting in the you know you're sitting in the car and I guess the gravity of the situation hits you. Uh, so <clears throat> you know the the world is now suddenly drastically changed for for you. Everything is different. You know, again, like you said, you didn't know anything, you know, about the, the the government or the inner workings. You know, you didn't have the 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 level of knowledge that you you have now. You know, the wisdom. Mm-hmm. So, how long after that day was it before you were approached uh, for an impromptu interview slash harassment slash confiscation of your film? Did you ever go back and watch the footage before it was confiscated? No, no, no. Well, you couldn't back then. You know, back then you couldn't, especially with experimental film, it had to be mailed off to Rochester to Kodak to be developed. And they didn't, you couldn't just drop your your film off at the corner drugstore and pick it up an hour later like you can now. It was, you would drop it off and two weeks later you'd get it back. And so, no, I never saw the film. I um, I went home that day and um, I took some tunnel, uh and went to sleep. Because I was just, I was just totally blown away. That's the only way I can explain it. I was just totally out of it. And I went to sleep. And um, I, but another strange thing happened, and my brother hasn't been able to explain it to this day. Uh, I walked into the living room, and the reason why they couldn't find me at first was because my apartment I'd given up uh, November the first, and my apartment was not going to be ready for me to move in until. December the 1st. So I was living out in Garland, Texas with my mom and dad and my brother. And I walked into the house and he's cleaning his gun. And he said, I thought I might need this. And I said, why? He said, I don't know. I just thought I might need it. And that's all he's ever said. He's never explained that to me, why he felt that way, why he was doing that to this day. And he's still alive with seven miles from me. And uh, so I went to sleep and my mother worked and she got home about 5, 4.30, I guess it was 4.30. And uh, she came in and woke me up, and she said, I want to go down, down. I want to see the fire. So I said, Mom, I'm not going down there. My mother never drove in her whole life. She never had a driver's license. And I said, I'm not going down there, Mama. She said, I want you to take me down there. And so I got up, and I, I drove my mother down, and I got beautiful stills. We took that day of the flowers. I got back home. I got myself back out. I didn't go to work that night. Abe Weinstein, in an interview that we did for him for my book, Not Mary in Dallas, he said that we were open that night, and I just didn't come to work. But I don't think so. I think he's not remembering it correctly. I don't think anybody was open downtown that night. And uh, uh, so, but I didn't go. It doesn't matter whether they're open or not. I did not go. And I went, uh, I took my mom down, came back, took some more channels, went to sleep. 
do the same thing Saturday. And she said, you're going to get up. I want to go see the flowers today. And I said, mother, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. And she said, well, you're going to have to. And I said, well, I'm just not going to. Well, she made me down there that day. So I have pictures of Friday and Saturday down at the Plaza of the Flowers. And one of them has my mother standing in the background. And I gave, um, for the first time, I let somebody use them in a book, and that's Robert Groden's new book. Those pictures are going to be in his new book. And um, I uh, I came back home. I knocked myself out again. Uh, I, I, to this day, sleep with a television on in my room because, it, to me, it drowns out the noises. And so if I hear something subconsciously in my sleep, it'll tell me that it's the television so I don't startle awake. And uh, Sunday, I woke up, and the first thing I see is my friend Jack Ruby, born away a man that he had introduced me two to three weeks before that as his friend Oswald with the CIA. And at 17, I didn't know what the CIA was. 67, I still don't know what they are. I'm going to pause it right there, ladies and gentlemen. Break sneaking up on us. When we get back, I'll pick it up right where we're leaving off. Powerful, powerful testimony so far. She's seen... President Kennedy shot. It was at 20 feet of her. And then after that, she turns on the TV and she sees her friend, Jack Ruby, killing a guy on live television. Remember the first murder, by the way, on, on live television. And the guy he's killing is someone else that she knows that she's been introduced to by Jack as a friend of Jack's. Her world was upside down. So we'll leave it right there. Don't go anywhere. We come back more with my interview with Beverly Oliver. We are back from Stay break, tuned. ladies and gentlemen. Let's get right back into it. My interview with JFK assassination witness, one of the very last surviving witnesses from 50 years ago. She was about 20 feet from the president when he was shot. And right before we went to break, she was saying how not only has she suffered through uh, witnessing that, and that was a traumatic experience. But then a few days later, she witnesses her friend Jack Ruby killing Lee Harvey Oswald on national television. So let's get right back into it. Here we go. I could not, my brain would not compute what I had just seen and heard. That this man that Jack Ruby knew had been arrested and I, I saw his arrest and realized that's who it was, but didn't, nothing was connected at that point to Jack Ruby. And then Jack Ruby walks into the basement of the police department and blows this man away on, on national television. That's just more than anybody's brain can, can absorb. And I, at that point, had no idea what they were talking about. They were telling us that he was up in the sixth floor a book depository building. Well, the shots didn't come from there. The shots came from the picket fence. Uh, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to absorb and put this all together in my drug stupid mind. What happened? What am I hearing? Why am I hearing this? Why are these people that are supposed to be leaders, why are they telling me this? This didn't happen. So I didn't go to work Sunday night. Well, on Monday night, my mother was a very smart lady. She realized that I was going to sit there and drug myself in bed shape. And she made me get up and she made me go to work. She said, you are not going to do this. Not at my house. You're not. So I drug myself up. I took a shower. I got ready. I went to work. And I arrived at uh, 7.45, just like I always did. And uh, there was two men up at the, uh, on the landing of the club. You went up a flight of stairs. There was a landing up the second flight of stairs into the store, into the club. But I wasn't disturbed because I was used to people waiting on that landing for the people who park in the car or whatever to catch up with them. And so I made my way up to the landing, and the taller of the two men stepped forward, introduced himself. He had proper FBI, or I guess it was proper, uh, FBI identification. The other guy flashed his identification. I don't remember his name. I remember what he looks like, but I don't remember his name. And, uh, but the guy who stepped forward and said, Miss Oliver, and I said, yes. He said, we understand you were down at the grassy place. He didn't say Dewey Plaza. He said, the grassy place, taking a film when the president was killed. And I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, have you had that film developed? And I said, no, sir, I haven't. He said, where is it? I said, it's in my camera. 
He said, where is your camera? Well, we all carried train cases back then with our makeup in it. And I said, well, it's here in my makeup case. He said, well, we want to take that film and develop it and look at it for evidence, and we'll get it back to you in a few days. That was November the 25th, 1963, and no one's seen it since. Have you ever uh, put in a a request to get your film back from them? No, and I never will. Uh, Other people have done it for me, though, and one thing that does... uh, stick out in my mind one document that I have a copy of from the FBI. It says the film which was taken, not claimed to be, not supposedly been taken, the film which was taken by Beverly Oliver was not retained by this office. So what does that mean? Retained means to have and to hold to keep. So does that mean they had it run across the hall so they could say that? What does that mean? They admit evidently having it. The film which was taken by Beverly Oliver was not retained by this office. Doesn't say they didn't. They didn't confiscate it. Doesn't say they never had it. So what did they do with it? Yeah, who they'd give it? Who did they give it to? Because mm-hmm. obviously, all, all, all they're saying is, "Look, we didn't hold on to it." They didn't even yeah. deny that you. They, they didn't even say that you didn't shoot any film. Sure. Yeah, they didn't say supposedly, possibly could have been the film which was taken by Beverly Oliver. At least they got that part of it right. And the, and the FBI agent that confiscated my film, his name was Regis Kennedy, and he was sent out Monday morning from New Orleans as a field agent to help investigate the president's death. There was also another document that I have that makes reference to a lady in a brown overcoat, or tan, I forget if it was brown or tan, anyway, an overcoat, uh, taking pictures at the time that the president was killed, and the school book depository would evidently have been in the background of her pictures. That was the morning of the 25th. I think it went out about 11 o'clock at 7.45 that night. That's when they confiscated my film. Coincidence? I don't think so. I don't either. I don't either. And then an even bigger coincidence of that was during the House Select Committee on Assassinations. When they were investigating, they were calling Regis Kennedy before them to give to do nothing but give testimony about my film, and he died. Suddenly? Just out of nowhere? That's what I heard. That is like four weeks before he just died. Now I don't know about, you know, exactly the time you know, time frame, but it was real close to when he was supposed to testify and he didn't make it to Washington. A lot of a lot of witnesses and investigators or uh people connected to this whole debacle seem to uh uh suffer untimely deaths. So I'm sure that was weighing on your mind after they the FBI comes in and takes your you know they come into your your place of work and they they take your your film from you, uh, were you harassed anymore after that by any of them or did it just well, everything went back to normal? I don't know who them are, <laughs> but yes, I and I was and I don't know I'm not accusing anybody of anything, but just like my boss telling me, don't go see Jack Ruby, keep your butt away from them. The FBI is following everybody that comes by there. You know, don't tell anybody you were there. Don't do this. Don't do that. And then Shari Angel's husband, Wally Western, he said, don't do that. You know, he disappeared for a while, but he wasn't killed like everybody thought. We, we finally found him. Just like little Lynn only died two years ago. She was not dead all these years. She died two years ago. Her, her son called me. He found my number in front of her stuff and called me. And uh, so I know for sure she's dead now. But there's just a lot of surrounding uh, peripheral issues like that that are also pretty scary. And I... Uh, I'm really not, um, everybody sees me as being a very gregarious, outgoing person. I'm really not. I'm very much a recluse. When I'm out in public, I'm an entertainer. That's what I do. But I'm I'm really very reclusive, and I think a lot of it goes back to them. So it was easy for me to be um, manipulated into shutting up and keeping my mouth shut. And the way that I actually came out, now I talked to my friends. They all knew about it. And, um, of course, my family all knew that the way that I came out was a totally by accident. I never intended to be this brave witness that you're talking about, this brave piece of history. That was never my idea in my life. Um, uh, my first husband, George Albert McGinn, was murdered. Uh, he was shot in back four times in the abdomen once. And again, I'm slain. He was the alleged leader of the Dixie Mafia. He was a hitman himself. And I married him at the age of 19. And, um, um, I had become a Christian shortly before he was before he was murdered, and uh, instead of seeing in that class, I started singing in churches. And shortly after his death, I was singing at the First Baptist Church in Joshua, Texas, 
the pastors and there was last name was James, Pastor James, and the uh, evangelist was Highland Caton and Jerry Wayne Bernard, Christopher, Crystal Bernard's daddy. And uh, I was singing with them that week, and I get there a little late, just in time to rehearse for the night. Well, back then, I really was a looker, and I wouldn't stay in a hotel because I didn't want somebody to be able to say that they saw me doing something I wasn't supposed to do. So I always insisted on staying in the home with somebody in the church, preferably with children. Well, I'm practicing with Drew Wayne when we were doing a duet that night, and this guy walks in, sits down, and he says, Beverly, this is Mr. Shaw. He said, Dad, I want you to tell him where you were the day the president was killed. And I looked at Drew Wayne like, what in the world are you talking about? I'm not going to talk about that. He said, he's really interested in assassination. He studies it. He's why don't you tell him where you were? So I sat down by this guy. I thought it was just the chairman of the deacons of the church. And I started, you know, just telling him what Jerry had wanted me to tell him. And the more I talked, the bigger his eyes get. Well, guess his home I was staying in that week. Gary Shaw, and he wrote the cover up, one of the first books. And so that night at dinner at his home, uh, everybody came over to his home for dinner. Well, the conversation actually went to the fascination, and I'm getting more uncomfortable talking about it. And so he said, "Well, let's move into the den because I didn't know some of these people. I didn't want to talk about it in front of people I didn't know." So he said, "Let's move to the den." We moved into the den, and there was a complete set of the Warren Commission report. I'd never seen one. Didn't know people. Had that. I mean, that was beyond the scope to me, and so I clammed up. I was scared to death, and I had to stay in the man's house for five days. But he was the one that finally um, got me to tell him almost everything I knew and uh, took me down to Dewey Plaza and showed him where I was standing. It matched the Zabruder film exactly. Of course, this was before the Zabruder film was ever released. And a guy named Penn Jones, and then a man named um, Richard Sprague, Dick Sprague, he's the one who dubbed me the Babushka lady because I had been promised anonymity. I did not want to be public. So then came about the uh, House Select Committee, and they uh, contacted me, and uh, I didn't want to talk about it. I was saying with Jack Moriarty, and I hung up on him. And he called again. I hung up on him. Derek, I said, don't talk about the fascination. So I'm trying to yell at me. He said, Ms. Ms. Massey, don't you hang up the phone on me again. You have to understand I have subpoena power, and we need to sit down and do this nicely, or I'll subpoena you. Well, I just I made an appointment with them to talk to them, and uh, but with the complete promise of anonymity. And so I made them come. I lived out in Ranger at the time, five miles down a dirt road, two, 200 yards down a mountain, on an 810-acre ranch. I didn't want them out there. I live like I live, reclusive like I do on purpose. And so I, I made an arrangement to meet them in Copeville, Texas, at my father in law's house, who was the pastor of the First Baptist Church, Copeville, at the time. So we met there, and I gave them a two hour testimony. But whenever you go to read it, uh, the script of it, the transcript of it, it's like 30 minutes. We headed to Indianapolis, Indiana to do a revival. That's what my husband and I do, we're evangelists. And on the front page of the Sunday paper was a picture on one side of it of me then back in the 60s, and then a picture of me at the present time. And it said, and the article was in between the two pictures, and it said, ex stripper to give testimony before the House Select Committee in Washington, D.C., something like that. They had my name, everything about me, and I had been promised anonymity. So that's how I was brought out of the closet. It was never intentionally, because I can tell you to this day, I'm not as scared as I used to be, but I still am very careful when I'm out and about. And um, I still don't appreciate that. I don't, I, I don't appreciate, I, I will tell them everything that they wanted to know, but I didn't, I didn't want to be out in the public. If I had it to do all over again, Papa, I'm telling you the truth, if I had it to do all over again, I would still let them believe I'm that hook-nosed woman with the, with the dark hair with my uh Head scarf on that's down there by the book depository building. Well, this this what you've been through had to have been rough. I mean, <clears throat> once it came out, I mean, even I, I'm sure now it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit lighter because I'm sure most of the people have disappeared. But I'm sure that even now you get, I'm sure you probably get threats. I haven't had any threats since 1993. Since my book came out in '94, I have not had any threats. Uh, I think they, whoever they are, have figured out. I've said everything I'm going to say. It's out in print. What can they do about it now? And, well, that, uh, that was smart of you actually to do that. That's probably why you're still around. It's well, one of the reasons because you did release well, the book. If you yeah, didn't I release did that the under book, the touting of, of uh, Nigel Turner and Oliver Stone. 
Well, that too. I mean, they, 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 the work that you did, you were a technical advisor on Stone's movie, right? Yes, I was. I was the only one that was hired from day one to day end. Okay, so we're we're in the we're in the seventies. They, uh, you know, you're you're outed now. Were you harassed at all by the powers that shouldn't be? Uh, you know, was there was there any anything that you had to put up with? Uh, yes. Any harassment or anything in between that and when Nigel Turner first met you? Yes, uh, I did. Uh, back then, like I said, it was before cell phones and things. So when we went to a church, we travel still today in a big bus. Uh, we have a overland coach, and we pull up at the church's parking lot, plug into their electricity, their phone back then. We knew how to plug into their phone, and if, if it rang and it was for us, they would buzz us. Okay, whoever this was calling knew how to do that. We would get calls at these churches, and uh, I would get these threatening calls, like, if you do so-and-so and such-and-such, you know, you're not going to live to talk about it, and then hang up. Well, uh, my son, Jasper Charles Massey III, we called him Trey. At the time, I gave testimony to Jack Moriarty and the other guy that was with him for the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Trey was um, two, two weeks old. And I'd had him C-section. He weighed 10 pounds and 4 ounces. And uh, so that's how they threatened me uh, about the House Select Committee. I got a call the day after I gave the testimony before we left for Indianapolis at my mother and father-in-law's home in Cobbville, Texas. And they said, if you don't shut your so-and-so mouth, we're going to get you where it hurts you the most. And this is going to be hard to be talking about. Um, and so I went on the road and uh, did whatever they asked me to do. And uh, we were in uh, Anderson, South Carolina, in a revival. And uh, we left here on Sunday afternoon to go to San Jose, to Mexico. And we got to sell my Alabama, and my little boy was breathing hard. And so we checked him into the children's hospital there in Selma, Alabama, at 11 o'clock in the morning, where it's 4.20 the next morning he died. And for years, I thought that I had had something to do with his death because somebody had killed him. They did not know why he died. And they did all kinds of aut- autopsies on him. And, uh, said that he died with a two-wrinkle blastic leukemia secondary to primary hyperoxylary, which was a very, 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 very disease, but no one that two minutes and 26 days old had ever died and never had died with a two-wrinkle blastic leukemia. And so I was just destroyed, totally, absolutely destroyed. And then three years later, I had a little girl. Her name is Laura. We call her Pebbles. And I know this has been a horrible thing to say, but praise God she was born with the same disorder because otherwise I would have gone on the rest of my life thinking that I had killed my son. And uh, because of that, she has had four transplants. She's had three kidneys and a kidney and a liver, but she's 32 years old today. And when she was six months old, for the first time in medical history, they took my kidney and put in my six-month-old baby at the University of Minnesota Hospital with Dr. John Manchurian. Wow. That's... I'm I, I'm speechless. That's uh first of all thank you thank you for sharing that that very personal uh a very personal and uh sad moment with everybody. If you want a minute Beverly to you know take a take a breather you can I totally no, okay. I, I totally understand. You're okay? I'm okay. Okay. Yeah, that's just a vital part of it for me. It may not mean anything to anybody else, but it was a vital vital part. Of my fears. Uh, I can only imagine here you're threatened, you know, where someone says, if you don't shut up, you know, we're going to hit you where it hurts. And then, you know, you lose your child. Uh, and less than two months later. Right. One would only rationally put two and two together. Uh, so uh, I can only imagine how scared you were. And I'm sure by that point, you probably, you that, you, that was it. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that put the fear of God into you. Uh, so you pro you know, and, and I, I can't, I, I can't fault you for that. I mean, that's that's horrific. I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, Thank that, you. You know, and no, then, uh, no parent should ever have to lose a child ever. Then in 1993, I got two letters. Um, it was after I did the men who killed Kennedy, and it was before. 
for the release of Oliver Stone's movie Jeff K. And what, it was just two letters, now two weeks apart, from Houston, Texas. And one of them, in big black letters, just said death. And I, at that time, I knew no one in Houston. And then two weeks later, I get one from the same zip code that said, snitch, you're dead. And those upset me, and I ended up taking those to the um, marshal in Lubbock, Texas. We lived in uh, Ranger at the time, and I took it to Lubbock to the marshal. And he said, well, we can't get fingerprints off of this. There's been too many people handling it. But he set me down. And I, I thank him to this day. Uh, if I can't remember what his name was. He told me, he said, Miss Ol- Massey, he said, um, let me tell you something. He said, if these people, whoever they are, were going to kill you or harm you, they're not going to warn you in advance and give you time to load your gun first. Just remember that. And so that did a lot to make my life easier. Yeah, so if they're threatening you like that, it's more out of intimidation and fear tactics. Yeah. I'm sure once you lost your child, they they probably realized, wow, that's, you know, horrific. And, you know, they, they might have even used that to their advantage that, you know, the, the letting you think that they could have been responsible mm-hmm. for it. You know, the, you know they, oh, play psycholo- they, they play psychological games like that. So that, you know, I mean, it, somebody probably went, you know, they probably had a meeting and went, did anybody do that? No. Okay, well, we're going to use this to our advantage anyway, uh, you know, for whatever reason. And, you know, we'll let her think that. And maybe that'll keep her, you know, you know quiet. And, well, it did, <laughs> for the most part, <laughs> for a while anyway. Well, so then when did, not, when did Nigel Turner, because I would assume that that's when you, you next, finally came out uh, public, right? Was when uh, when you spoke to Nigel, or was it when you published yeah, your book? No, it was Nigel. The only reason that I uh, did the thing in Kilkenny for Nigel Turner, uh, he and I did the same thing to Olive Stone. This is kind of a funny story. Their secretary kept calling me, and I said, look, I don't talk to secretaries. If Mr. Turner wants to talk to me, you have Mr. Turner call me. And he did. We met. And I really liked him. He, he's a person who you just know that he's trustworthy the first time you ever talked to him. And he told me, I said, I, I don't want to do it. I said, I, uh, if it's going to be shown here in the United States. He said, oh, it's not going to be shown here in the United States. He said, it's strictly for Europe. So I felt safe. This is a way I can get my story out for posterity without it becomes a threat to me because the people aren't going to see it here in the United States. So I'm not going to have to deal with it. So I did it. I'm very proud. I did it. I think it's a good piece. Um, and, um, but a couple of years later, I think we did that in 88. I think it was 89, 88. And, um, I found out a couple of years later that he is trying to deal with, I believe it was the Fox network to get it brought to the United States. And I absolutely went into a panic, and I called my attorney. And he said, Beverly, do you have it in writing? I said, no, but I had his word on it. He said, that doesn't do any good. He said, let me tell you something. The more public you can get, the faster you can get there, the better off and the safer you're going to be. I said, do what? He said, the more public you can become, the safer you're going to be, and you need to do it as fast as you can. It was like two less than a month after that that Oliver Stone's office called me. And then I had to decide, do I want to be Oliver Stone public? So the same thing. If Oliver Stone wants to call me, I had no clue. I don't do, I didn't do movies. I still do very few. I said, uh, uh, if Oliver Stone wants to call, if he wants to talk to me, he can call me. And so he called me. I met with him. First thing he asked me, he said, have you seen any of my movies? I said, no, have you seen any of mine? <laughs> That's where our friendship started, and uh, I didn't know who Kevin Costner was. <laughs> he showed me pictures of Kevin Costner, and um, but I'm much more educated now about the movie world. Thank you, Papa. <laughs> I was kind of dumb. <laughs> that's kind of funny. I like that. That's uh, that's <laughs> that. That's funny. Have you seen any of my movies? No. Have you seen any of mine? <laughs> 
Well, I do have a movie. It's about my life story. Not not having anything to do with the Kennedy assassination. It has to do with my children. And how many people can just throw out that line like a comeback to Oliver Stone? I mean, how many people can say that they have that little anecdote in history? That's so cool. <laughs> it was fun, and I love Oliver Stone. I think he's he's great. And Kevin and I still keep in touch occasionally, and maybe a little bit more than occasionally. And uh, I just um, I uh, I thank Oliver for allowing me to be uh, part of that movie because it healed a lot of things in me. It answered a lot of questions for me. And by that, I say that um, uh, not about the conspiracies or anything like that, but like the day, the first day that they uh, did the headshot, um, it made me so sick to my parking lot and threw up. But that first time that they shot those guns down there in Dealey Plaza, I realized what that smell was I smelled down there that day. It was gunpowder. See, I, I still had the memory of that stench in my nose, but I didn't know what it was, even when I got hunting with my brother. Uh, you know, Dealey Plaza is like kind of down in a hole, and so everything just like drifted down into that hole, the smells and everything. And uh, so... When that happened, I knew immediately what that smell I remembered smelling down there that day. It was the gunpowder. And until I did, even after I did The Men Who Killed Kennedy, I would not go through Dewey Plaza. I'd go 15 miles out of my way to keep from driving through that plaza. But now I can, I can go down there. I had not been down there except to take the investigators down there and show them where I was standing. I had not been down there since that day. And now I can, on um, on certain occasions, if somebody's doing a documentary that I really feel good about it, um, I will go down there for them. I, I still have a horrible feeling when I'm down there. I don't like it when I'm down there, but I can do it, and that's what's important. I can it. It's almost like you have a form of PTSD, and I, not, I wouldn't even say almost. I mean, PT, you could have PTSD from any type of traumatic event, and being 20 feet away from the President of the United States and having him watching, you know, having him have his head blown off. Uh, and, you know, like you said, that's got to be a very surreal experience, something that, you, you know, again, only your explanation. We're going to pause it right there, ladies and gentlemen, because the break is sneaking up on us top of the hour break it's only three short minutes when we get back I will pick it up right where we're leaving off probably end up rewinding about a minute for full context especially for people just joining us in hour number two during the break go check out Beverly's book it's over on Amazon.com Nightmare in Dallas by Beverly Oliver and Coke Buchanan Nightmare in Dallas go to Amazon.com look it up purchase it and she does autograph them piece of history ladies and gentlemen I suggest you get one sooner rather than later all right stay tuned we'll be back in a few short minutes don't go anywhere ladies and gentlemen welcome back to hour number two here on tonight's live edition of down the rabbit hole it is november 19th 2013 i'm your host popeye from federaljack.com tonight i am playing my off-air interview that i did with Beverly Oliver. She is a JFK assassination witness, one of the very last surviving ones out there. And her story needs to be told as many times as possible. As many possible people that can hear it need to hear it. It needs to get out to as many people. This is history. This is something that you're not told. You don't see the mainstream media... Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS. You don't see any of them running to beat her door down and interview her for the 50th, do you? No. She was 20 feet from the president when he was shot. Don't you think that it would be in this country's best interest to interview her for history? Nope. You would think at the 50th anniversary, they would want to interview one of the last surviving witnesses to the event. Nope. So tonight, 
I'm giving her as much airtime as she possibly needs. So without further ado, let's get right back into it. I rewound it about a minute for full context. She was talking about the trauma of the event, the trauma that she experienced from the assassination, and then a few days later, watching Jack, her friend Jack Ruby, kill Lee Harvey Oswald on live TV. Here we go. Until I did, even after I did The Man Who Killed Kennedy, I would not go through Dewey Plaza. I'd go 15 miles out of my way to keep from driving through that plaza. But now I can, I can go down there. I had not been down there except to take the investigators down there and show them where I was standing. I had not been down there since that day. And now I can, on um, on certain occasions, if somebody's doing a documentary that I really feel good about it, um, I will go down there for them. I, I still have a horrible feeling when I'm down there. I don't like it when I'm down there, but I can do it, and that's what's important. I can do it. It's almost like you have a form of PTSD, and I, not, I wouldn't even say almost. I mean, PT, you could have PTSD from any type of traumatic event, and being 20 feet away from the President of the United States and having him watching, you know, having him have his head blown off. Uh, and, you know, like you said, that's got to be a very surreal experience, something that, you, you know, again, only your explanation uh, and your your level of detail, Beverly, could could actually help us understand better than, you know, like you said, the the Zapruder film doesn't do it justice. I mean, that's it's grainy footage as it is. So, I mean, it's you know, there are still some people to this day that are like, oh my god, that's horrific, and that's just grainy footage. I mean, I can only imagine if they had the cameras that they have now, uh, what the footage would look like. But it still doesn't replace the memory of what your brain actually witnessed and what your subconscious locked away you know, in your mind 50 years ago. Do you still see it in your... Can you still see it clear as day? Oh, it's just like it happened yesterday. And I still... This is the weird thing about the dreams that I have. When I wake up, I'm expecting to see on TV that he's still alive. So every time I dream that, I relive it, but then also live the expectation of him still being alive till you know, those few seconds we're off and I'm awake and I know that He's not alive. He's not coming back. And it's like a very real feeling that you can actually feel. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's like it's almost like I hear on the TV right before I wake up that he was just injured. He is not her. He he was just injured, and, it, and it's Walter Cronkite's voice, and he says, "Oh, oh, breaking news." The president is not dead. He's just severely injured. He's critical, but he's going to be okay. And then I wake up, and he's not okay. He is dead. And the world is still in a pile of crap it's in. It's interesting how our brains work. It really is. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how we compartmentalize traumatic events. People people did the same thing with 9-11. For me, it was 9-11 because I was actually uh, very close. I was... uh, in North Jersey, and I was a volunteer firefighter at the time. I could actually see the smoke and smell the death from where I lived. So it was, uh, uh, you know, same type of experience. Uh, you know, I, I, I can understand, but I, I still not to the level that you know you have, and nobody could. Only, only people that were there that day. At uh, that smell, you will always remember it, won't you? Oh yeah, uh, there's there's that nothing odor, that to this smell, day. You will always remember it. I know people that have old gear. And they have it locked up, you know, they have it like in bags because of the toxic crap. Mm -hmm. But if they open it and it's anywhere like in the vicinity of, you know, a room I'm near or whatever, if I walk by something that came from the site that wasn't washed down and might still have some dust or whatever, I can smell it. In fact, one of the most, uh, one of the craziest experiences I've ever had, and I've, uh, I've never really talked about this, but I'll, I'll tell you about this because I feel comfortable with you, Beverly, and you know you've, you've experienced you know traumatic things, so you can appreciate this. Uh, a couple of years afterwards, I went to the fu- I went up by the fire academy that I had gone to uh, when I was younger, and they had a memorial uh, with some of the steel uh, from the, the World Trade Center site, mm-hmm. and I, I went up watching. and I touched it with my hand. And I just, I, 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 I just, I, I hung out there. It was, it was really weird. It was a very serene, cold day. It was about 30 degrees. 
the snow was out. It snowed, and I was the only one out there. It was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and you could pull up in the parking lot and just go there and reflect whenever. I, th I think it's still there as far as I know. So I got out of my car, and I was the only one there, and I walked over, and I was you know looking at the you know the, the memorial, and I leaned over, and I put my hand on it, and I closed my eyes, and I could I had the most surreal experience. I could feel all the negative energy. I could feel just everything that happened that day coursing through the the metal and you know into me and i don't know how to explain it you know my i tell i've i've only told one or two other people this story and it when i told them they kind of looked at me like i had six heads and i'm like you've obviously never been that touched or that close to something that i don't know maybe you know it didn't touch you that way but for whatever reason when i touched that metal it's, i could hear it i could feel it i could remember everything from that day plus i could also feel it's like you could feel the energy coming right out of the the uh the steel so i know what you're experiencing because i i um there's a couple of days a year that i go down to daily plaza late at night i can't go down there at the daytime to, and do any type of meditation or anything because people recognize me and i'll tell you when i go it's just starting to be here today and i don't take a single stem rose and lay where i was standing and uh i swear i hear those shots So I know what you feel. I can't explain it. It's it's kind of like a deja vu thing. I, it's, you know, it doesn't happen to me every time, but it does real frequently happen. It, it's like I'm sitting there on a curb, and it's like it all happens all over again. Except it's not. It's dark. I can't see. I... Uh, Still would change that day if I could. Uh, it's uh, I've met lots of very interesting people. And another thing that I don't do, Papa, is like you know I do symposiums and stuff. But all I do is tell what I saw. I'm not a researcher. I do not research the assassination, and that's because I and it, like when I go to these symposiums and stuff, there'll be these brilliant people speaking. But I don't go listen to them because I still have hope. Now, like Dr. McClellan, I, I've done a few with him. Uh, I'll go listen to the doctors at Parkland and stuff like that because that doesn't affect what I saw down at Dewey Plaza. You see what I'm saying? Uh, but people who, like, I, I never knew what Gene Hill saw. I, I still don't know what Mary Mormon saw. I don't know what the Newman saw. And because I have hopes of someday getting on a witness stand and raising my hand and swearing to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. And I don't want what I saw to be tainted and clouded by what Gene Hill saw or Mary Mormon or this guy or that guy, I, I want it to be my testimony. That's smart. That way, you know, because there are times if witnesses sit down and talk to each other, sometimes they fill in the gaps for each other, and then they collectively mm -hmm. have the same memory. So that's actually smart. Um, and history actually uh, thanks you, because I'm, I'm sure you would have liked to have talked to these other witnesses and share your common experience, as, which is a normal human trait. And yet at the same time, you didn't. Uh, and... That's actually, you know, you didn't research you know, and go into and, and try to find out. And that's, uh, as as weird as this is going to sound, history sh kind of owes you for that because you still have your recollection of what you experienced, your perception of what was going on, not your perception mixed with anybody else's. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's not going to be either. And you know something, though, that I want to share a, a big blessing uh, through all this and because it's always a small silver lining no matter how dark the day is. And one of the things that I have really appreciated through the years that since I did the movie JFK and I was able then to go back down to Dewey Plaza almost every year, I think with the exception of two years, I've been invited to participate in the memorial service for JFK, which is uh, oh, it's just astounding to get to do that. And uh I start off the program usually by singing uh, President Kennedy's favorite hymn, which is Amazing Grace. And uh, then I start out with the Star Spangled Banner. And then at 1230, when he was killed, I step up to the microphone and I say Amazing Grace. And uh, this year, though, I'm not going to get to do it. On the 50th anniversary, I'm not going to get to do it because they have daily plots blocked off. So if, you're, if your listeners are at all interested, I wish they would like the mayor of Dallas. His last name is Rawlings. 
and have them express their displeasure. First of all, that they can't come, and that a witness who was there can't sing like she always does. Yeah, it's disgusting what they're doing for the 50s. It's, it, 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 it's, it, it's illegal. It's against the Constitution. It is my constitutional right. Here, it's your constitutional right. They have no right that, that applies to all men whatsoever. It's, it is restricting my freedom of speech and my right to gather uh, a public place. It is a, a historical site. It has been designated as a historical site. They have no right to go down there and block it off. None. Yeah, and then they're doing they're doing background checks on. Um on people who want to uh, put in to, to get the tickets to go, because I looked into it about two months ago, you know. I was one of the first ones, and I filled it all out. I don't care. I don't have anything to hide. I filled it all out. Do you think you'll get, like, a ticket, or are they just going to say no? Are you kidding me? They're not going to let me have a key. I'll be the most surprised person on the face of this earth if I get to go down there. Even though I am not one who talks about the government doing it. I'm not one who talks about black helicopters. I, you know, I don't want, I don't, I'm there to honor his life and memorialize his death. That's the only reason I go down there. I think it's ironic that they, they, you know, block people off for a memorial service to a president that actually gave a speech about, you know, being open and, mm-hmm. you know, you know, secrecy and everything else and secret societies and everything else and talking about this stuff. <laughs> and here you have, you know, a small select group of people blocking off a very public area. Not just for that day. They have it the week before and the week after. Oh, so you can't even go, because I heard that you, I heard it was only going to be for an hour and then it was going well, away. So I think that's what they have started saying now. And if they do that, I'm fine with that. It doesn't matter whether it's at, if we're there from 1130 to 1230 like we normally are. Uh, it's still it's still the plaza. It's still where he's killed. It's still where his blood cries out for justice. You know, I don't care if it's ten o'clock at night. I just want to be able to go down there and sing my two songs and pay respect to my slain president. That's all I want to do. I didn't know that they actually wanted to do it for a week out and you know a week before and a week after. That's the way it started. <laughs> Doesn't surprise me. I mean, I didn't know that, but it doesn't surprise me any. I mean, but you know, I'm um, sure there there was. I'm sure the huge backlash because I know that there was backlash uh, to it. So I'm sure that probably helped shorten it. But still, and there's it, also some uh, injunctions being filed too. Oh well, good. I'm glad people are actually taking. You know, a, a, I do air quotes when I say it, legal action, but at least somebody's putting something on paper on record doing okay. something because that's the kind of stuff that needs to get done. I mean. They show their hand, Beverly, when they don't allow you to go down there and sing, especially mm-hmm. considering you're, or and they don't invite you. Not that like they don't allow you, but like they're you know they're going about this the way they are, you know, purposely to block people from get you know certain people from getting in, and they don't invite you to participate because you know whatever. Obviously, they have their reasons, but they don't want eyewitness gives a different you know a different account. What are you talking? Can't have that. Can't talk about that. So they just, you know, they they block you from coming in, but they show their hand when they do that. I mean, you've been uh-huh. down there numerous times before, so not inviting you almost to me that that actually, you know, if I was a, if I was sitting on the sideline, I would say, "Hmm. That's odd. This lady always gets a chance to sing there. Why wouldn't you let her and everybody go down there? It's like a thing they do on the uh, on Kennedy's, you know, the the anniversary of the assassination. Why wouldn't you just let them go?" So by blocking everybody uh and doing that, yeah, that does show their hand. I actually plan on uh, being down there this year. Uh, Good. So, uh, yeah. Cause, have fun, huh? Yes, I, I when I when I get there, I will definitely uh, I will hit you up because uh, um, uh, I'm interested in getting a chance to meet a, every, a lot of the people that I've gotten a chance to interview uh, in person. So it'd be interesting. Plus, I get I want to get a chance to film you uh, singing. I'm gonna do it if I have to stand at the edge of the line, you know, where they have it blocked off. Um, I'm going to do it, whether or without their permission. They can throw me in jail if they want to. I don't care. Yeah, but they can just throw you in jail for singing. Although, in the country we live in now, <laughs> you, ne- you never know, right? Before I forget to get to a, a few questions, there's a few other things uh, I, I did want to ask you really quick. Nigel Turner, uh, mm-hmm. after he did the film and everything with you, have you heard from him? Because I know that the last three episodes, the, you know, part seven, eight, and nine, people think that the men who killed Kennedy is only a six part series. It's actually a nine part series. And the last three parts got blackballed by, uh, Mrs. Johnson. 
and, and if, you know, and all the people I, I heard the the Bushes and the Clintons uh, helped out in that. But of course, because of the information in the last three is extremely damning. Uh, but uh, Judith said that she hasn't heard from Nigel. He kind of like fell off the face of the planet. That's you know. So I was wondering if you had the same experience. You know, have you heard from Nigel, or did he just up and disappear? The last time I heard from Nigel was in 2004 when he came to my daughter's wedding. And um, he came all the way from England to attend my daughter's wedding, and we had a wonderful evening. We set up in our suite till like 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning visiting and eating and uh, just having a good time at the reception and everything. And um, it was just a delightful evening, and uh, he left, and I've not heard from him since. And did he tell you, you know, at all during the night? I think he, he had a conversation with you, but he told you what was going on, right? He explained a little bit. Told you that there's mm-hmm. a little bit of harassment. And he told me about the about the uh, history channel pulling all of his documents. They're not showing any of them, not even one through six anymore. And uh, that those were those had been I forget the word that he used, but confiscated more or less. And um, we're not they were not going to be allowed to be shown. And I do know one of the person that he saw after that. He came back to the United States a couple of weeks. Ago. I don't know if he just went to New York and then came to see my friend, uh, or to, yeah, went to England and came back. But anyway, a couple of weeks later, he had dinner with a friend of mine that he met during the wedding, and um, that, and she never heard from him again since then. Yeah, I wonder what they uh, they threatened him with. I mean, obviously I, I they. Don't might, know. It, 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 and he was from England, right? So I mean, mm-hmm. Lord knows, London. yeah, Lord knows what they what they did over there. They probably once you have once he was back across the pond, they probably just told him you cut all ties or that's it. And that was what back in the nineties. Uh, that was two thousand and four. Or oh, they ran him into a wall in a tunnel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. You're you're right. He, I mean, he could be gone. I mean, and you, you know, we'd never know it because as long as the news media didn't pick it up and didn't make a big deal out of it. And um, I wouldn't. Uh, yeah, yeah. Our controlled media make a big deal out of something mm-hmm. that they should. Yeah, right. No, they instead they they make big deals out of stuff that's not a big deal at all. Um, I did want to ask you really quick. The feds figured out who you were. I'm sure Garrison's crew could have figured out. Yeah. Who you were. So did they ever? I, did they ever come down and talk to you at all, or no? Only only my phone. And basically, the 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 scene in the movie where they're interviewing me outside Jack Ruby's club. When I was introduced to Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, that happened by phone, and I just told them. They asked me if I would testify. I told them what I thought, and just like exactly like it was in the movie, except it was on the phone. He asked me if I would testify for them, and I said no, I won't. I said if they can kill the president of the United States in broad daylight and get away with it, they can kill a two-bit show girl like me, and it'll never make the back page of the paper. No, sir, I will not. And that was just so that, that, that piece, like where they came into the club, was added, I guess, for a little bit of drama. But that actually did happen. Yes, but okay. it happened on the phone. Yes. And the only other thing that happened that was not exactly as it was portrayed in the movie, well, there were two other things. One thing was is that when I was introduced to Oswald by Ruby at the club, David Fury was sitting at the table. David Fury was not sitting at the table, but he was at the bar. Oliver had to do some things like that to put the people together that were together without taking up any more time because they are two hours, three hours and 17 minutes long. And the other thing that he did that I hear people criticizing is the Mr. X testimony uh, in Washington. That was a compilation of three people's testimonies. But that's the only way that he can get all that information in that needs to be in. But everything in the movie is accurate as far as the details and the testimony. You know, a lot of people, they say Mr. X doesn't exist. It, 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 and you're right. It's it's off of the three different people. But if people want to mm-hmm. see, you know, if people want to see who, who like, the base, I would, I would say out of the three, like, the main base of the, 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 the at least one of the, the main base of that character would be Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty. Yeah, that's who's Mr. Fletcher L. Prouty. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, people that's don't... Exactly. I've done I've done entire broadcasts on the man. I mean, he was... Interesting. I, I've interviewed Leno Senek multiple times, uh, to, talking about him. Uh, you know, Colonel Prouty was definitely an interesting person. And yeah, and, you know, M- Mr. X. Obviously, he. You're right. He had to take a little bit of creative design there to, to 
to figure out how to get all that information into one character so that people could at least understand it. But the information is real when you go research it. Yes, it is. And uh, so I have no problems with that kind of literary license as long as the truth is still there. You know, it, it doesn't change the truth of the testimony at all. Another thing that you're a like a, a puzzle piece for is the fact that Jack Ruby knew uh, Lee Oswald. Oh. And David Ferry. David Ferry was in the club so many times that whenever whenever they uh, Gary Shaw brought the mug book to Joshua, Texas for me, that he had three mug books and he had me pick people out that I knew and recognized from them and that's where I found the picture of Regis Kennedy, the manager of my film. And he asked me, I got to David Ferry, and I'm staring at him. He said, do you know this man? I said, yes, he was the assistant manager to Jack's club. That's how much he was in that club, Papa. I thought, because when we went to New Orleans, I think it was in June or July before the assassination, Jack had gone down to hire some more showgirls, which that's where he got Jada and from the show bar. And then um, he said, I'm going to be looking for an uh, assistant manager. I need some help in the club. So... Then we get back, we're back, you know, a couple of weeks or so, and this guy starts hanging around, and he's standing by the door, and he's welcoming people in, and he helps himself. You know, back then they didn't have microwaves and stuff. We just had those little toaster ovens with little bar pizzas in it. And one of the things that, that Oliver was really shocked about was that Dallas was BYOB back in 1963. Jack did not drink, but he kept uh, a private selection uh, of good liquor behind behind the bar underneath or whenever he had friends that came in and stuff, his important friends. And uh, this guy, this baby three dude, would go help him set to Jack's liquor. And I assumed he was the assistant manager that Jack had gone to New Orleans to find. Uh, and I was laughed at about that when I was 17 and told, well, I was 17 when I told Gary Shaw that, but when I told Gary Shaw about that, they thought I'd lost my mind. And now you see how deeply ingrained David Siri is in the assassination. Very. I actually just did another off-air interview a couple of days ago with Judith about David because she's writing a book about him. So he's, I mean, he's a very interesting character. So you're, again, just more, it, it's interesting how you vindicate a lot of aspects of her story and then the stuff that she knows about David Ferry and, you know, how he knew Ruby and everything and Lee that it vindicates a lot of the stuff that you talked about. So you can tell when, when this stuff is real because people that never have talked to each other, they they have stories that they know things that you couldn't know unless it was real. There's a difference between someone acting and faking and someone actually knowing it because you, you lived it. It's like my mother told me, you know, a false story is easy to forget because it didn't happen. It's not ingrained in your memory, whereas the truth is easy to remember because it's the truth and that memory and actually happened to you. So you actually remember that perception of what happened. And you, once you saw David Ferry, uh, you would never forget David Ferry. I mean, uh, Joe Pesci's look in the movie was handsome compared to David Ferry. When people ask him what David Ferry looks, looks like, the only description that I can give of him is he looked like a buzzard. And he looked big. He had these little bitty tiny beady eyes. And they were kind of far set apart, little tiny eyes, actually. And he had alopecia. I didn't know what that meant back then. Uh, but he just said he had something that made his hair fall out. And so he wore this wig that it looked like he had made it himself. It's just the weirdest looking thing I've ever seen. And he took cold pencils, not an actual eyebrow pencil like I would use or that the girl she used with a cold pencil and drew this arch over his eyes for eyebrows. It was weird looking. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to pause it right there. Final break of the evening coming up. Three short quick minutes and we will be right back with the final segment and the rest of the interview with Beverly Oliver. One of the last surviving JFK assassination witnesses. Go check her book out, Nightmare in Dallas, available on Amazon.com. I urge you to purchase it. And again, she will autograph every copy. Stay tuned. We are back from break, ladies and gentlemen. Final segment here on tonight's live edition of Down the Rabbit Hole. Just incredible testimony from an incredible lady. I can't plug her book enough, Nightmare in Dallas. She has not paid me to plug it. I don't make any uh, commission off any sales. I'm telling you to get her book because it is a piece of history. It is 
eyewitness testimony from, again, one of the last surviving witnesses. Uh, it's untainted, which uh, Beverly gets into you know, during tonight's interview, uh, how uh, she never mixed her information with anybody else's, any of the other witnesses. She never researched and looked into it to any degree. She's never read any books. She doesn't do that because she doesn't want to taint her memories. And that's smart. So what she remembers is what was recorded in her brain on that day. And just like anybody that remembers 9-11 vividly, that's younger, maybe doesn't know much about the Kennedy assassination, but for an example, if you remember where you were and everything that was going on around you when 9-11 happened, well, it was that way for people our age uh, and, you know, around that our age of the time when 9-11 happened and even younger, like Beverly was 17 years old. So she has a fresh operating mind and that traumatic experience has now heightened all of her senses, and just like it does with all of us, right? And it is now going into record mode. And what she has, the information that she has in her head, is what she witnessed and what she experienced. It's not tainted or mixed with anybody else's. So go get her book, Nightmare in Dallas, and she does autograph them again. And she is just one of the sweetest people I've ever met on this planet. She really is a genuinely nice human being. So, purchase her book just to help support her. But, purchase it because it's a piece of history as well. And you know how I am about books. I always tell you, get a physical copy of a book. It's better to have a physical copy of a book than any type of ebook that could be out there at all. Just go get a physical copy of her book. Again, Amazon.com, Nightmare in Dallas. All right, let's get back into it with the rest of the interview. Picking up where we left off, she was talking about David Ferry. So I rewound it uh, a minute or two uh, so full context of the conversation could be understood. So I rewound it right back to where we started talking about David. So here we go. Another thing that you're a like a, a puzzle piece for is the fact that Jack Ruby knew uh, Lee Oswald. Oh. And David Ferry. David Ferry was in the club so many times that whenever... Whenever they, uh, Gary Shaw brought the mug book to Joshua, Texas for me, that he had three mug books and he had me pick people out that I knew and recognized from them. And that's where I found the picture of Regis Kennedy, the manager of my film. And he asked me, I got to David Ferry and I'm staring at him. He said, do you know this man? I said, yes, he was the assistant manager at Jack's club. That's how much he was in that club, Papa. I thought, because when we went to New Orleans, I think it was in June or July before the assassination, Jack had gone down to hire some more showgirls, which that's where he got Jada and from the show bar. And then um, he said, I'm going to be looking for an uh, assistant manager. I need some help in the club. So then we get back. We're back you know, a couple of weeks or so, and this guy starts hanging around, and he's standing by the door, and he's welcoming people in, and he helps himself. You know, back then they didn't have microwaves and stuff. We just had those little toaster ovens with little bar pizzas in it. And one of the things that, that Oliver was really shocked about was that Dallas was BYOB back in 1963. Jack did not drink, but he kept uh, a private selection uh, of good liquor behind behind the bar underneath for whenever he had friends that came in and stuff, his important friends. And uh, this guy, this David Free dude, would go help himself to Jack's liquor. And I assumed he was the assistant manager that Jack had gone to New Orleans to find. Uh, and I was laughed at about that when I was 17 and told, well, I was 17 when I told Gary Shaw that, but when I told Gary Shaw about that, they thought I'd lost my mind. And now you see how deeply ingrained David Siri is in the assassination. Very. I actually just did another off-air interview a couple of days ago with Judith about David because she's writing a book about him. So he's, I mean, he's a very interesting character. So you're, again, just more, it, it's interesting how... You vindicate a lot of aspects of her story and then the stuff that she knows about David Ferry and, you know, how he knew Ruby and everything and Lee. That it vindicates a lot of the stuff that you talked about. So you can tell when, when this stuff is real because people that never have talked to each other, they have stories that they know things that you couldn't know unless it was real. There's a difference between someone acting and faking and someone actually knowing it because you, you lived it. It's like my mother told me. 
you know, a false story is easy to forget because it didn't happen. It's not ingrained in your memory, whereas the truth is easy to remember because it's the truth and that memory and actually happened to you. So you actually remember that perception of what happened. And you, once you saw David Fury, uh, you would never forget David Fury. I mean, uh, Joe Pesci's look in the movie was handsome compared to David Fury. When people ask him what David Fury looks, looked like, the only description that I can give of him is he looked like a buzzard. And he was big, these little bitty tiny beady eyes. And they were kind of far set apart, little tiny eyes actually. And he had alopecia. I didn't know what that meant back then, uh, but he just said he had something that made his hair fall out. And so he wore this wig that it looked like he had made it himself. It's just the weirdest looking thing I've ever seen. And he took cold pencils, not an actual eyebrow pencil like I would use, or that the girls use, it was a cold pencil, and drew this arch over his eyes for eyebrows. It was weird looking. Yeah, I I have pictures of him, and I... <clears throat> I've seen pictures of him, and uh, <laughs> David was an interesting-looking character, to say the least. If you, uh, <laughs> yeah, you could tell that if you met him in real life, like that he's one of those people. And I've, I've met people like him. I, um, I used to work, I, I, I used to work in, uh, in South Beach, and I, I used to run a tattoo shop, and uh, I met some interesting characters while working down there. So, like, I, I know what you mean. Like when you, there, he's one of those people that. Even if you only were around him for a brief period of time or saw him maybe for a couple months or whatever, it doesn't matter. He's one of those people that you never forget. You know, uh-huh. the, the, the image of him because he sticks out because he's so out of the ordinary. And that's usually uh-huh. the same description that everybody has of David Ferry. A lot of sadness involved in it. Um, the biggest tragedy, of course, is to America, losing our president that I think should he have lived to the world would be a different place. And that's what a lot of people don't realize. You know, like the little girl that you were talking about that you educated her on the death of the president. Uh, it didn't just change America. It changed the whole complexion of the world, of the whole world. Because as America goes, there goes the world. How many how many different wars might not have happened? Well, we wouldn't have 80, how many, 80,000, 86,000 men on that wall in in Washington. Well, yeah. The president had lived. Vietnam wouldn't have happened. That's what I'm talking about. There wouldn't be those 86,000 men on that wall. Uh, I wonder if the first Gulf War and the second Gulf War would have happened. Perhaps uh-huh. perhaps would 9-11 happen? Because, I mean, I don't buy the official version of that either. So would would, would 9-11 have happened? I mean, the world would, I think the world would be a drastically different place. Well, for one thing, America would still have the respect that we had back in 63. And uh, we would have still had the power. We would have still had the moral standing that we no longer have. Do you realize back in 1963 that the three biggest problems they had in our schools was running in the halls, talking in class, and chewing gum? Those were the three biggest problems in our schools in 1963. Now, it's with pregnancies, violence, and drugs. Drastically different. Mm-hmm. Like the complete opposite end of the spectrum, I would say. Mm-hmm. Could be. It couldn't be the more polarly opposite. And and how long, by the way, were, were the what was it seventy five years from the date of the assassination that all of those records are in the the uh, the film and everything that like including your film footage because it's still locked up somewhere in some vault. Uh, it, it, what did they say originally? Seventy five years. It's going to take for that it stuff. Seventy five. Like I said, I'm not a researcher, but I, I think it was 75. I think I think it's due to be released in 2026. And that's because obviously they want to make sure that every witness is dead, every, mm-hmm. every everybody connected to it is dead. That way, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And it'll just be. And a it'll all be it'll all be redacted anyway. Like if you were to go make a FOIA Freedom of Information request uh, on Roscoe White which was the policeman I saw on the plaza that day, uh, you'll get maybe two paragraphs and everything else of all the pages that you'll get on will be redacted. That's that's typical. So if you look up Roscoe White, mm-hmm. <laughs> it'll just come make, back. Go ahead and make, make a FOIA request for his name. And it'll come back with just, because yeah, I've seen what they look like when they redact them. You'll get the, it'll have the header of the page and then just mm-hmm. black lines all the way down the page. Mm-hmm. Here you go. Here's your freedom of information. And you're like, um, 
Yeah, there's no information there's on the here. information. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, there's lines of black ink. This doesn't help me. Well, it's paperwork. The law says we have to give you the documents. Yeah, but there's supposed to be information that's on the documents. Either the Bush or the Clinton order, I don't remember which one of it was, said unredacted copy. But you see, redaction is not, it's my understanding I was explaining to you, but I believe it was uh, uh, John Newman, Major John Newman, that they don't black it out like we see it, like we think it's blacked out like with a marker. It's actually cut out. It is cut out and then put on the black screen and copy. That's why it looks like it's black markers. Well, that's so smart. Because that there's there's it. no way you can go, there's because if it was copied with black ink over it, you'd mm-hmm. probably be able to pick up the image beneath it if you had a good scanner. Now they have ways of pulling you know pulling the layers away with laser. Yeah, so that makes all that makes a lot of sense that they would literally just cut it out with a razor blade and then put a black screen behind it. Yep, that's exactly what they did. Or that's what I was told by Doctor Major John Newman. Can you imagine how boring that job has to be? It's got to be mm-hmm. like a, a room full of cubicles where people just have paperwork and exacto knives, and they're just cutting stuff out and then throwing that into a shredder or something. Don't you think that it has to be people that are trusted with that information? It, it couldn't be like just the general public person that's hired to be a janitor or whatever in the the archival or whatever. It, it's it has to be somebody with a little knowledge, first of all, to know what they need to cut out. It's Very true, not, because it's not like it's not like the paperwork. I'm sure they just don't hand it to them with big red markers with the stuff mm-hmm. highlighted out with, you know, cut here. No, they don't. And uh, so, you know, some, I keep hoping, and people keep saying, somebody's going to talk someday, and I'm waiting for that someday. I really am. Because I know there's people out there that still has knowledge that they've never told. Maybe in a threat of the death of their children or whatever, they don't talk. Or maybe maybe there is some genuine kind of sort of patriots that was involved in it that thought that they were involved with it because it was the best for our country or something. You know, that's that's a possibility. That people were so brainwashed and so hogwashed that they participated thinking, well, this is what's the best for my country. I'm going to do it because it's what's best for my country. And it was what destroyed our country. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, the fear, um, you know, I, I find that the, that fear, uh, you know, I've asked a lot of other people I've interviewed about this, that you know, that, that were either like Judith or anybody else that might have been connected to it, not not so much researchers, but like people like yourself. And, and they say, I always ask them, do you still have that fear of, you know, whatever that, that, you know, that monster that you feared back then, do you still have that fear of it? Mm-hmm. And everybody always says yes. I mean, do, do mm-hmm. you do you feel the same way? Yeah, and one of the reasons is because what what are, what are we the most afraid of? The unknown. The unknown. I think if I knew who they are, this is frightening. You know, it's like we always see the devil as a, a a dude in a red red suit with a pitchfork, and we don't recognize him as that angel a lot when he comes. And that's the way I think we are about whoever they are that killed our president. They don't come to us in a red suit, in a pitchfork, in a fork it tail. They come to us as an angel of light. You know, I I always say to people, kind of like the same way, uh, people ask me about like the the top of the tier, you know, when they talk about the powers there shouldn't be or the Illuminati, whatever people call them, right? Uh And they say, well, who is it? You know, somebody who, is there a castle somewhere where they live? Like, what kind of, you know, opulent palace do they live in? And I said, honestly, they're probably like these old mafia dons. They probably live in a ramshackle old house. They probably drive a 30-year-old vehicle. And you'd never have any clue that they are who they are. And that's why you don't know who they are because of how they, they you know, they handle themselves. They're so, your next-door neighbor. Exactly. They're the person that checks you out at the grocery store. That little old dude that bags your groceries that you think is mm-hmm. is there because he you know he must have lost a, you know all of his money in some some sort of you know uh, Ponzi scheme or something yeah no I come to you as an angel of light which means honesty and forthrightness that's just not the way it is but you know I hope I just really hope that I'm alive when the truth comes out I I really. 
that's my dream. I have only recently started doubting that I would be, but I still have that little seed of hope, Papa, and nobody's ever going to kill it. Well, honestly, Beverly, I, you are already alive, and I think the truth has come out already. Like as a researcher myself, because I know you did, you know, like you said, you 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 don't do a ton of research because you don't want to taint your, your memories, which is smart. Um, but I myself, as a researcher, can tell you that the truth is pretty well, pretty much out there. I mean, even the government doesn't; even, they could redact everything that they want. They could take everything off the page except for the header and the date. Uh, and you know what? Wouldn't matter uh, because there's so much information out there now. Uh, that, like I said, it's more than ni- it's like something like ninety two percent of the country believes that the you know just from the evidence alone that the government did it. And there's I mean there there would be gaps that would be nice to be filled in. Don't get me wrong, but I believe that you can you know rest easy at night knowing that the truth, you know just from what I've seen, the truth is like I said it would be nice to fill in the gaps here and there, uh, but the truth is pretty much well known. Uh, and again, it's because of the courage, like people like yourself, that even though there's that there was that fear out there, and you knew that there was something to be, you know, somewhat afraid of. You still, no matter what, I mean, you went through some pretty horrific stuff, uh, even even blaming yourself at one point, you know, and you still, after you went through that, you still had the courage to push forward. I mean, I, I even though that wasn't to blame, I know so many people that would have been just put off by even thinking that, that that would have frightened them about anything in the future and kept them from doing anything. And yet that didn't stop you. So I have to thank you, Beverly, and the world, not just this country, but the world and history owes you a debt of gratitude, my dear, because, um, Without your courage, we wouldn't be privy to the eyewitness plus background information that you know about, like Jack and you know Lee and you know uh, David Ferry. Not that it's you know not that it's a ton of information, you know, just to say, <clears throat> yeah, and I know you knew you knew Jack, but just the fact that you know uh, enough information that that's a big chunk of the puzzle. Like I said, that that people might not put together right off the bat, but that's a that's a big piece and. You know, it again. It, that that takes a lot of courage to talk about stuff like that. So history owes you uh, a lot. History really does owe you because you you still had the courage to not only talk about your experience, but then talk about the other background stuff you knew, and then even add your own personal experiences over the course of time. As I said, you yourself are a large part of uh, the history of the assassination of President Kennedy, and I thank you so much for your time today. And, you know, again, the courage that it takes to stand up. Well, I want to say one thing before we get off of here. Go ahead. And that is that I just want to thank you and men like you and women like you who have picked up the torch, who've picked up the burden, who, who's carrying it to the end and researching and digging and plowing and prodding and, and not giving up because y'all are the reason that we know what we know. And before you go, Beverly, I want you to give yourself shameless plugs. If you have a website, uh, I want you to plug it. And if wherever anybody can purchase your book, um, go ahead and please let everybody know. Uh, I, I want them to be able to purchase the book. And ladies and gentlemen, you know I don't do this unless uh, I'm going to do it myself. But you should purchase the book, and I'm going to purchase a copy of her book myself. Get it because it's important. So where can they purchase a copy of it? Well, before I tell them that, I just want to tell you how humble I am that you said what you said to me and how much I appreciate your support, and I will always appreciate it, and I thank you for it. And uh, my website is www.massegee.org. And then you just go in there and you hit on products, and it'll take you to my CDs and my book. Or you can usually get it on Amazon.com, and uh, it's called Nightmare in Dallas by Beverly Oliver and Coke Buchanan. Well, I urge that everybody to buy it right from the website because I know that if you buy it from the website, you guys get, you, you know, buying it from the website helps the author out more than it does if you get get it from Amazon because Amazon always has to give the author a little less because that's their deal. They offer things for less. So go to the website first. 
Amazon second because it going directly to her website supports her. And you know, it's not like she makes a ton of money off this, but she sticks her neck out telling you the truth. The least she could do was purchase the book right from her and her website. I'm not autograph that way. But if you want it or not, I autograph every book that leaves my house. That's my honor to get to sign that book. Well, you see, and, and again, you're a, a living piece of history, uh, Beverly. So, ladies and gentlemen, go to her website, purchase the book. Not only will you get the book, but she's going to autograph it for you as well. That is awesome. Uh, you know, Beverly, again, it's it's been an honor being able to sit here and uh, uh, talk your ear off for you know over two hours now. You uh, are definitely a gracious Southern lady, and uh, the, the younger generation could learn a thing or two from your generation for sure without a, a shadow of a doubt. And there's one other statement I want to make, the last statement in my book. And that is that the pledge to our flag, the last statement is uh, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And my question is, does that justice pertain to our presidents? Thank you so much for coming on, Beverly. And uh, it's uh, an honor. You. Well, Papa, it has been fun. And uh, I look forward to seeing night. you in November. Have a good night. Bye-bye. There she goes, ladies and gentlemen, Beverly Oliver. I urge you to get her book, Nightmare in Dallas. Go to Amazon.com, purchase it. She autographs them. She's one of the last surviving witnesses to the assassination. And as you heard, she didn't taint her testimony by going and sitting and having coffee with other witnesses and comparing notes and everything else, or going and listening to other researchers, and then allowing her brain to formulate new thoughts and taint what she actually had witnessed. Nope. She kept that clear and clean. We actually owe her for that. Whether or not you realize that, ladies and gentlemen, we owe her for that. Because we have this uh, untainted, clean memory of that day. So, purchase the book. I promise you won't be sorry. And last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, before we run out of time here, because we have a few minutes left... This weekend, the 23rd, the 24th, and the 25th, there will be a free conference memorializing the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President Kennedy. Speakers will include Jim Mars, Ed Haslam, Chris Milligan of Trine Day Publishing, Judith Vary Baker, Dick Russell, myself, Beverly Oliver, and others. You don't want to miss this conference. It's going to be a good one. So make sure if you're around in the area, if you're anywhere in the vicinity, even a few hours drive away, come down. It's a weekend. You know, make it a, a two-day, tr- you know, weekend trip or whatever. And Trine Day is going to be down there. Uh, you know, like I said, Chris Milligan's going to be down there. Uh, he's going to have uh, a bunch of books from a bunch of different authors with him for sale. I know uh, Jim Mars is going to be there. Any of the authors that show up are going to have their books for sale. I'm sure Beverly Oliver will have her books for sale. She's going to be there. She's got a book about her experience, as you all know, mentioned here tonight. So if you're in the area, and you're going to be anywhere around Arlington, Texas, the weekend of the 23rd to 24th and 25th, come on over to the Eunice Center. 1000 Eunice Street, Arlington, Texas. It starts 1 p.m. on November 23rd, Arlington, Texas. Be there. And also, if you're interested in learning more about the JFK assassination, I have an entire download archive section on federaljack.com. Go over to the download section, and when you go to the download page, uh, I think it's the second or third one down, it says JF. It might be the second one. It's JFK uh, archive. Click on that. It'll open up a page, and it's a a very basic, like 1990s style root directory listing. And everything in there uh, will show up as a blue hyperlink. Just right click on it and you know, hit Save As, and then whatever you want to title it. It should come up with the title of the video, though, uh, or whatever ebook. Um, uh, or audio, it should come right up with the title that I already have there and just you know save it to whatever hard drive or wherever on your computer and uh, download away for free. That's why it's there. Included is the entire uh, YouTube channel that Judith Ferry Baker has set up with a, a bunch of different videos that she's put together over the course of time and information 
uh, exonerating Lee Oswald. So if you go to the uh, the JFK section, her entire YouTube channel, I backed it up and I put it up there, as well as a ton of other information, uh, PDFs, audio, videos, the entire Men Who Killed Kennedy series, including the missing pieces 7, 8, and 9, all the broadcasts I've done on JFK, just a ton of a ton of information up there, all for free. Go check it out. Rip it, download it, take it. That's what it's for. Ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time. I'll catch you all again live tomorrow night. Remember, all week long special JFK broadcasting. I know the tunnel seems dark and long, ladies and gentlemen, but I can see the light at the end of it. And I know that after each broadcast I do, you can too. The truth is not always pretty. Sometimes it is horrific. But it is still the truth. And that will lead us to that light at the end of that tunnel. And I'm with you every step of the way, so don't be afraid. Catch you all again tomorrow night. Love you all. I'm out.